Our final speaker is Alexander Nawagabo, uh, Anishinaabe, and now, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and a member of Whitefish First Nation with roots in Ganawage. She has just completed her second year of the Cultural Mediations Program uh, in Ixclac. What is that? You're really, you're hard on me here. <laughs> in the visual cultural stream. <laughs> At Carleton, right? <laughs> Her PhD research in Zabin's indigenous art and material culture from her traditional territories surrounding the Great Lakes and focuses on the significance of family, community, and youth. And this will be very helpful, I think, when you look at the little doll who happens to come with a baby in a Tikanagan. So, Alexandra. Knock it down. Thank you very much. Um, and I just also wanted to thank the conference organizers for organizing this uh, Kwahi. I'm very excited to be here and I'm looking forward to the next few days. So, Anish Ejibamadzian. This old Anishinaabe greeting, which is commonly understood as an interpretation of the quick and everyday, hey, how's it going, is actually translated to mean, how are you living or how is your life? It's a question my Anishinaabe Mwin teacher, Jeff Maneg, jokingly says that you better make sure you have time for before you ask, because you could be listening for a while. Indeed, in the Anishinaabe worldview, the concept of life and living, or more specifically, Minabamadzawin, living the good life, is a complex one, and is viewed as a composite understanding of holistic health and wellness, including physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual states of being. This notion of life is often conceived as being circular and oriented to the four cardinal directions. And given that the symbol of a circle concentrates the totality of everything that is from the four directions to which it points, it reiterates the importance of wholeness. In keeping with this understanding, many Anishinaabek have described the natural rhythms of the path of life as a spatial passage over four hills. According to the Anishinaabe storyteller Basil Johnson, these hills of life correspond to different physical and moral stages. The first hill is the stage of infancy and childhood a time of preparation or the age of listening. The second hill is youth, a time of quest or the age of doing. The third, adulthood, a time of vision or the age of giving it back. And the final fourth hill is old age, a time of fulfillment of vision or the age of sacred learning. Through this understanding of life, therefore, we can see the way in which interdependency and the intergenerational exchange of knowledge and teachings between these four stages is fundamental to a community as well as to the perseverance and survival of a people. According to the anthropologist Diamond Janess, the Wasaksing Anishinaabek believed that the continuity of moving life and the connection between the four stages of being was dependent on the work of the woman in her role as mother, the creator and carrier of life. The Wasaksing Anishinaabek held that the Milky Way was, quote, like an enormous bucket handle that held the earth in place, and the lifeline is like a human Milky Way. It is the chain of ancestors and descendants together with all the inheritance factors they carry with them. It is through the life of an Anishinaabe woman, Madeline Cat Terrio, in her autobiography, Moose to Moccasins, and some of her very special family treasures, which are now housed in the Royal Ontario Museum, that we can begin to understand the rhythms of the four life stages, as well as the roles of the women and the significance they play in the continuity of the lifeline. For as we will learn from Basil Johnson's teachings, on the holistic understanding of Bamadzuin, he says, there is continuity, there is no break. Named Kakita Wapanokwe, meaning Wise Day Woman, Madeline was born and delivered by a midwife in a tent on Bear Island, Lake Tomogamy, in 1908. In her first years, Madeline and her mother, Elizabeth, lived with her mother's grandparents, Angela and Michelle Cat Sr. However, when Madeline reaches around the age of two, her mother can no longer care for her. And from that point onward, Madeline is raised by her great-grandmother. This custom of kinship adoption was and is still very common in many Indigenous communities as the work of mothering is not biologically defined. The identities of mothers, aunties, grannies, and adoptive mothers are viewed as fluid and interchangeable roles. Producing life and raising children is collective work. Having been raised by her great-grandmother, Madeline fondly remembers spending a great deal of time with her as a child, and says that most of her learning about the Indian way of life and the interpretation of her surroundings came from her great-grandmother's daily teachings. Through this early knowledge transfer, Madeline describes her great-grandmother, Angela Catt, 
as the driving force that helped her to, quote, set her path in life. Which brings us to our initial incline of Basil Johnson's Four Hills, infancy and childhood, the time of preparation and the age of listening. In the Cree Métis scholar Kim Anderson's reading of Basil Johnson, quote, the traditional role of children is to bring happiness and hope to all because they represent potential and the future. This early life stage involves being nurtured, being dependent on others, and developing trust. It is also a great time of learning that occurs through the sensory experiences of listening, observing, and feeling the rhythms of life in the community that surrounds you. This method of learning that is grounded within the traditional understanding of the transmission of knowledge becomes materialized and is made possible through the daily use and design of the Tikkanagan, the cradle board. Anderson explains that for the Anishinaabe people, life, all life, was understood as being imbued with spirit, and individuals had the responsibility of demonstrating care for the life forms around them. And in keeping with these principles, new life was celebrated because it meant the continuation of a people. Part of this celebration of new life included ceremony, feasts, and also the family's creation of the child's cradle board and moss bag. Typically, in reflecting the complementary skills of men and women and following traditional course, the wooden backboard is crafted by the father or grandfather of the child, while the mother or grandmother creates the covering. An infant spent the greater part of its first year placed on a cradle board, and in Anishinaabe life, the Tiknagan served many purposes. However, one of its most highly valued characteristics was that it was the place of protection that ins and ensured that a mother had her infant constantly with her. And from the cradle board's upright position, either on a mom's back while traveling or propped up against a wigwam while the mother was at work, the child observed daily life, listened to the stories and songs of family members, and experienced all of the natural rhythms of the surrounding community. According to Kath Oberholzer, who has done work on the connections between the use of cradle boards and child development within Cree communities, it is when an infant is snugly laced within a cradle board that they develop an awareness of self and a sense of belonging to a people. In Musham Denny Muskwa's understanding, as outlined in Kim Anderson's work, this sense of self or sense of purpose and a sense of community is actually something that is learned from the womb. It therefore seems fitting that Kath Oberholzer, who has so eloquently described Tiknoggins as a womb with a view, sees the cradle board as a further extension of the feeling of warmth and security that one has while still in utero. In this first stage of life, developing trust and feelings of safety and belonging are paramount, as the time of infancy can sometimes be very precarious, and the soul of a child can easily slip back into the spirit world. According to Diamond Janess's Anishinaabe informants from Wasoxing, because the infant's soul and shadow are so active at this time, they are only attached to the baby's body by very slender bonds. And so during this precarious life stage, young people require special protection and feelings of security. It is for this reason that many Anishinaabe mothers carefully adorn the coverings of their child's cradle boards with protective designs and powerful spirits that shelter the baby wrapped within. In the quilled cradle board ornament to the left, hourglass shapes act as abstracted motifs of the manitous of the sky world, the thunderbirds seen in the bag on the top right and interlock with diamond shapes, a form that some scholars believe could represent a stylized representation of, a powerful, of the powerful water manitou, Mishibiju, the underwater panther, seen in the bag on the bottom right. According to David Penny's reading of this arrangement, the positive negative diamond and hourglass pattern could possibly indicate an abstracted representation of the layered cosmos and a balancing of the dualities of, sky, of the sky and lower worlds. Scholars have previously mentioned how frequently designs related to Manitous often, appear, often seem to appear on containers. According to Ruth Phillips, when these kinds of protective motifs are applied to a container, such as the twined bag shown here, it is possible that the contents themselves would have rendered the power that was retained within the designs that surrounded them. This understanding leads us to believe today that many containers that are ornamented with these protective motifs may have been originally used to hold medicines or other sacred items. If we think about the cradle board, if we think about cradle boards as vessels or containers that held babies, it seems fitting that they would also be ornamented with these same kinds of powerful and protective designs that were used to bless our medicines. This thought reminds me of something I remember my good friend Geraldine King from Gull Bay First Nation saying about the first time she held her newborn son, when she referred to this moment very poignantly as holding her own little medicine bundle. 
According to my auntie, wrapping a baby up tightly in a moss bag is a way of letting the child know that they are safe, that they belong here. In nurturing an infant's feeling of security, this wrapping communicates the significance of the child's place, not only within the spectrum of the family and community, but also within the continuation of the lifeline through generational ties. In Madeline Cattario's autobiography, we witness her journey through the various life stages. First, as a young infant swaddled in her own cradle board in the initial stage, and secondly, on the next hill of life as a youth, wherein, according to Kim Anderson's reading, one is meant to learn and practice independence, discipline, and responsibility. It is an age in which she says, all members of the community have a hand in ensuring that you learn what you need to know. In Moose to Moccasins, Madeline recounts the way in which she learned as a youth from her great-grandmother, skills that would be required for her later in life, like weaving rabbit skin blankets, tanning and smoking moose hides, sewing snowshoes, and sewing sheets of birch bark into beautiful containers. It is through these kinds of teachings and the transmission of knowledge that Madeline received from her great-grandmother in her first two stages of life that prepared her for the third hill of adulthood wherein Madeline begins to take on her own role as a mother, teacher, nurturer, and carrier of her own children. The time of adulthood, or the age of giving it back, is a time for carrying responsibilities for providing for family and community. And when Madeline reaches this third hill and it comes time for her to raise her own children, Madeline's grandfather, Michelle Kent Jr., in keeping with tradition, crafts a wooden cradle board and assembles it with a fine beaded front cover that was earlier done by Madeline's mother, Elizabeth, in 1919, before she passed. This cradle board, which Madeline donated to the Royal Ontario Museum at the end of her life, serves as somewhat of a materialization of what the Wasoxing and Anishinaabek referred to as the human Milky Way, or the moving life chain. In lovingly ornamenting their cradle board cover with floral beadwork, Madeline's mother, Elizabeth, just a few short years before she passed, was preparing her future grandchildren for their entrance into the first stage of life, and was therefore doing her work in helping to preserve the lifeline. Although the creation of a cradle is the symbol of, a, of the beginning of one new life, it also serves as a representation of the continuity of the ancestral life, the continuation of a people. In this way, baby carriers can be viewed as objects that look towards the future, while also simultaneously looking towards the past. Indeed, this cradle board seems to have a voice of its own in retelling the histories of the women who prepared and carried it. As mentioned earlier, it was very common in many indigenous societies for other women in the community to take on the role of mother for the younger generations. And for Madeline, the full embodiment of this role was held to its greatest extent by her great-grandmother, Angela Catt who guides us to the final climb of Basil Johnson's Four Hills, old age, a time of fulfillment of vision or the age of sacred learning. Even at this final stage, Basil Johnson asserts that life's work is not yet finished. By living through all the stages and living out the visions, our elders know something of human nature and living and life. What they have come to know and abide by is wisdom, and this is what they must pass on to those who still, to, who still traverse the path of life and scale the mighty hills. Although in Basil Johnson's model, old age is, is signaled as the final slope of life, it is important to remember that the holistic notion of Anishinaabe theories of knowledge informs us that life is circular and cyclical. And in this understanding, the work of the elder, who has reached the fourth stage, is to ensure that this circle remains intact. And more specifically, it is the grandmothers and the old ladies of our communities who hold the responsibilities as the ultimate guardians of kinship. They ensure the protection and continuation of the lifeline and inaugurate what Jeffrey Anderson refers to as life movement, a principle that the cosmos persists ongoing motion by virtue of an ongoing generational exchange. The cradleboard of Madeline Catterio can be viewed as somewhat of a manifestation of this concept in that through its creation, it was passed from mother, Elizabeth, to daughter, Madeline. However, the intergenerational exchange or life movement that is found within this cradle board, in fact, seems to extend through at least four generations within Madeline's family. During a practicum placement at the ROM a few summers ago, Trudy Nix, the senior curator in the World Cultures Department, having already known of my interest in Madeline's life story, kindly showed me a rather remarkable find that was also part of the ROM's collection from the Eastern Woodlands. Collected by the anthropologist Frank Speck in 1914 during one of his visits to Bear Island, 
This birchmark basket was part of his own personal collection and was later donated to the ROM in 1958 by his wife Florence. Under the lid of the basket, Speck inscribed in black ink, women's work, basket made by Mrs. Cat, Tomogamy Band of Jibwa, Lake Tomogamy, Ontario, 1914. Now, apart from the slight misspelling of the surname Cat, there is certainly a strong indication that the creator of this container may have been Madeline's great-grandmother, Angela Cat. Interestingly, a journal article written by the anthropologist Reginald Ruggles Gates that records his work in Bear Island, Bear Island in 1924 suggests that Madeline's great-grandmother, Angela, was commonly known in the community as just that, Mrs. Cat. However, what is quite remarkable about this little birch bark basket and what seems to further suggest that it was made by Madeline's great-grandmother, as it was pointed out to me by Trudy, are the similarities in floral design between that which is on the basket and the beadwork applique in, the, in Madeline's cradleboard cover. As we have already seen in Basil Johnson's understanding of the four life stages, the younger generations rely on their elders for, the, for their teachings and their work in, in the passing down of traditions just as those in the older generations rely on the young ones to provide hope, happiness, and a future. This deeply entwined intergenerational exchange can be seen in the floral design of Angela Cat in her birch bark basket, which is later echoed in the applied beadwork of her granddaughter Elizabeth, who ornamented the cradleboard cover of her own future grandchildren, the children of her daughter, Madeline. According to David Penny, the sharing of designs and patterns among Anishinaabe women was quite common. Just as skills of survival, like skinning moose hides and making moccasins, were passed down between generations of mothers, aunties, and daughters, so too were the traced paper templates that were used to ornament beautifully handcrafted things. These two objects are family members. Separated for many years and acquired by the museum at different times, they have become reunited and are currently on view together in the Royal Ontario Museum. I imagine their excitement in seeing, a, in seeing familiar faces in each other perhaps visiting, and once again, sharing family stories. Expanding the scope of self-portraiture to include such handcrafted objects as these allows us to engage in an enriching practice that Lee Miracle calls storying up. She writes, this is how oratory is born. Oratory is a painting. It is about the freedom between beings and about cherishing the distance between them. It is about relationship, and as such, it is about life. Oratory is a human story in relation to the story of other beings. Indeed, at the very heart of ourselves are our relationships with others and the cherished and entangled stories of our families and extended families across generations. Indeed, in looking at the Madeline Cat Terrio cradle board, we have come full circle. From the fourth hill of life, there is Angela Cat who in keeping with tradition would have provided her granddaughter, Elizabeth, with knowledge and teachings that appear to come to life in floral form in Elizabeth's beadwork. Elizabeth, as a mother, rests on the third hill and helps to prepare her daughter, Madeline, a youth at the time in the second life stage for parenthood by creating a cradleboard cover for her future grandchildren, the little ones who were then later carried by Madeline as they began their steady climb on the first hill of life. This very special object, in addition to providing a warm and protective place for Madeline's babies to sleep, learn, and feel secure, speaks of an entire history of women and is a direct physical representation of the lifeline and what Jeffrey Anderson calls moving life. In Madeline's written life story and through the account as told through her cradle board, excuse me, it is Angela Catt, Madeline's great-grandmother who takes on the traditional role of the ultimate guardian of kinship in providing to the women of the younger generations, who in turn learn to care and teach the following generation, Angela Catt ensures that the cycle of life, and therefore the continuation of her people, perseveres. Likewise, Tom Hill and Richard Hill Sr. maintain that children are the reasons we seek information, share it, and pass it on. They are the focus of the transfer of knowledge from the elders, completing the cycle of life's journey. Additionally, many Anishinaabe women comment on the great amount of safety they remember feeling with their grandmother. As one of Kim Anderson's participants, Hilary Harper says, I don't know where it all stems from, but grandmothers were always the protectors of children. And another, Maria Campbell, recalls the way in which her grandmother's bed was always the closest to the door, while the children slept the furthest. This ensured, she says, that grandma knew who was coming and going. Thus, it seems fitting that through her beaded floral design, with her presence warmly wrapped, <laughs> with her presence warmly wrapped around the future generations, the great-grandmother, 
Angela Cat, as the ultimate guardian, soothes and ensures the safety of the babies held inside. What we see in Madeline's cradle board is both the importance of looking towards the future, but also the necessity in returning to our past, which harks back to the familiar adage, you have to know where you are coming from in order to know where you are going. Indeed, the connectedness that we feel to those who have come before us and the hope we have for those to come after us is the lifeline in its most truest form. Life movement occurs through knowledge transfer. Culture and ancestral lifelines, as understood by Tom Hill and Richard Hill Sr., are not preserved in books, films, or even in museums. They are preserved when Native children learn the traditions of their people and express them in new ways. And just as Madeline has taught us as the readers of her life story, so did her great-grandmother, Angela Catt, also teach her granddaughter, Elizabeth, the importance of remembering traditions and passing them on. For us, Angela's lesson lives on through her great-granddaughter's story, and also through her revived floral design, about which Basil Johnson's words shall serve as an appropriate closing. Though former modes can no longer be exercised, they live on in memory. By their very sweetness and worth, they call out for living on. They deserve to be repeated in life again and again. What is good needs to be regenerated many times over. But to resurrect the past in forms already done is to negate survival. The same flower does not live, die, to live again. It lives, dies, and is no more. But after death and passing, it leaves a memory of loveliness and a promise of renewal of that beauty in another spring. Thank you.